My name is Andrew Dodge. I have spent the last 11 years getting to know some of America's most notorious criminals, such as serial killers, spree killers, mass murderers, domestic and foreign terrorists, and many more types of criminals. Unforbidden Truth will bring you exclusive interviews with convicted criminals, professionals in the mental health and law enforcement field, and much more. Subscribe to Unforbidden Truth on any podcast platform to join me on a -a one-of-a-kind true crime experience. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we conclude our look into the Darley Routier case and answer the question, is an innocent woman in prison or did Darley murder her two children? everybody and welcome to this episode of the prosecutors i'm brett and i'm joined as always with my convivial co-host alice oh that's such a happy word thank you it's a happy word and thank you to justin who suggested that one i don't know how convivial i am tonight i had to put the kids to bed by myself because i'm single parenting this week and it's it's you know it's a It's a physical event to wrestle these kids to bed every night. (laughs) I bet. I'm not going to lie. I don't actually know what convivial means. I mean, it sounds like one of those happy words, so I assume it's a good thing. Like, you know, you're convivial, (laughs) but maybe it's a bad thing. I don't know. Do you know what convivial means? I think it's supposed to be good. It's someone who's really, like, happy and lively. Is that what it is? Yes. Is that what it is? (laughs) I see. So, convivial, like Darley Routier during the Silly String incident? Oh, Brett. The silly string incident. We've made the people wait until this new episode incident. to talk about it. I know. We really left you guys on a cliffhanger there, but we probably could have squeezed everything into three episodes, and maybe some of you wish we had, but I think this is going to give us the opportunity to really talk through these last few things, talk through all of this stuff together, and reach a little bit more well-thought-out and considered conclusion. But we are going to start today with the silly string incident last time we were with you we were talking about dolly's behavior and what it tells us about this case well one of the things that people talk about the most is the silly string incident and we're going to talk about the silly string incident but i just want to start off by saying it's very strange so (laughs) the way you know we researched this case and we really focused on the the record in this case. And only afterwards did we listen to what other podcasters had said and and watch this video. Did not watch this video until basically everything else was finished in our outline. And one thing that I think is strange, I just want to give all of you permission who think that the silly string incident is really weird to to feel that way. To feel like it is completely weird and completely inappropriate. Whether Darley is innocent or guilty, Because everybody tries to like poo poo that feeling like you shouldn't feel that way and you need to, you know, be more objective about this. I don't know that anyone in Darley, I think now acknowledges what a, what an awful look that was. I don't think anyone can watch that video and not be negatively impacted because of it. Yeah, I think that's right. And we'll we'll go more into it for those of you who don't know what we're talking about. But, you know, I actually watched the silly string episode right before we started recording today so before our last episode because i wanted to save it um and not have how she responds you know so soon after the death of uh her sons i didn't want my view of whether she did it or not to be affected by how she responded because we've talked so many times about how everyone responds differently but it's strange so brett i think we should probably give people a little more context of what we're talking about Sure, let's do that. So as you may recall, the murders occurred on June 6th, the morning of June 6th. Eight days later, Friday, June 14th, Darley invites a number of people, including Barbara Jovel, who was just everywhere in this case. We've talked about her 
earlier to a graveside sort of, I mean, celebration is the only way you can put it, of the seventh birthday of Devin. And in Darley's defense, I mean, this was supposed to be a celebration. It wasn't supposed to be, you know, where everybody's just crying all the time. There was some crying. One thing defenders of Darley often point out was what you see in this video is not the entirety of what happened that day that there was what you might think is more appropriate behavior early on. But whatever was going on early on, at this point, you have Darley and a number of people at the graveside. Also there was Joe Munoz of Channel 5 News who was filming the event. And this is another interesting thing about this. Sometimes people say that the police secretly recorded this event as if, you know, Darley didn't know this was going on, but I actually think they are conflating two different things, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. The family certainly knew that on this day they were being recorded, and in fact they actually gave interviews with the press afterwards, and when you watch this video, what you see is a group of people, Darley in the center, she's smiling, she's chewing, chewing gum, she's spraying silly string all over the grave, and she looks elated. I mean, she looks very happy. And everybody else is also sort of taking part in this. But when you look at them, they are, are less into it than, than Darley is. And it's one of those things that it just it can't help but strike you. This was something the jury found striking when this was admitted into evidence. People complain about that sometimes that this came in. This is absolutely admissible. This absolutely goes to Darley's state of mind. The jury can give it whatever weight it wants to give it, but it certainly comes in. I don't think there's any real argument that this is not going to come in under some 403 analysis, that it's just too prejudicial, so it's not going to come in. And the jury watched this video several times, and there were jurors who said that this was the most important piece of evidence to them. Not really that important to me. I mean, I do find it kind of shocking, but it doesn't really make me think she did it or didn't do it. It certainly, if you think she did it, I'll put it this way. If you think the evidence lines up that she did it, then this is kind of like Scott Peterson at the memorial. It's him at the memorial, smiling, yucking it up, talking to his, you know, his mistress who's in France. You might say, well, that doesn't really tell you anything. That's not really evidence that he murdered somebody. But he kind of is if it lines up with all the other evidence. It sort of tells you about his state of mind. And this is a very similar thing to me. When you see this, if up to this point you feel like the evidence is really pointing you towards Darley doing it, I think this is the kind of thing that tips you over the edge. You know, what's interesting about it is when you're watching the video, there's, you know, balloons at the grave site, um, which is perfectly, I think, probably even appropriate, you know, for his birthday, they're trying to celebrate it. And you see Darley spraying silly string, she's kind of dancing around. But it really um, shook me when the camera zoomed in on her face, because there's one thing to be, you know, trying to bring celebration to a very sad moment, but her face was this kind of wild glee um, that did not match anyone else's face that was um, at the, at the celebration graveside. And look, I, I want to be very clear because I don't want this whole case to turn into Alice and Brett thought the silly string video was disturbing and that's why they think Darley is guilty. I mean, Alice literally just watched this video. <laughs> I mean, I watched it with yeah. her for the first time. I actually and... forgot to record it, uh, record me <laughs> watching it. So sorry, everybody, but. This is like we watched it less than 10 minutes ago. Right, exactly. So, you know, I mean, this is like her live reaction to it. And and one thing I just want to point out, when people don't want you to take this video into account, they talk about how behavior doesn't matter and, and different people react different ways and we need to look at the evidence. The weird thing about this case is the same people who are telling you that are going to tell you that behavior does matter when it comes to Darley and you know, the way she reacted to the murder that they don't believe it's possible she could have cut her own throat, for instance. I mean, when you say that, when you say, I just can't believe she would do that, what you're saying is, I can't believe that this person would, that their mental state would allow them to do that to themselves. I mean, that's essentially what you're saying. It's not like you're pointing to evidence. I mean, you're not saying it's impossible because, you know, the way the knife was or something like that. I mean, you may point to that, you may say that, but that's not what most people do. Most people say, 
How could you believe that this woman would cut her own throat and put herself within two millimeters of killing herself? That's behavior. You're just talking about her state of mind. That's what you're doing. It's the same thing here. It's a different kind of behavior, and it's obviously on the other side of things, but so much of this case becomes what you think Darley would or would not do if she were guilty or innocent. Now, we have mostly pointed to evidence. We have tried to really stick to evidence because who knows, right? I mean, I think at the end of the day, people who don't like to focus on behavior, despite the fact that the FBI is all about it, you know, and and this is kind of the double-edged sword here of behavioral analysis. We tell you all the time, you don't necessarily want to look at somebody's behavior and decide they're guilty or not. You know, I mean... I always think back to the Amy Bechtel case where her husband has been tarred with suspicion that he may have murdered her based on nothing other than what he said when he called the police because he made sort of a gallows humor joke about how he's got some, he's got somebody missing and wants to know if they found anybody or something. You know, we got a, we got, we got a person missing. Do you have an extra? I forget exactly what he said, but he made some sort of, you know, nervous, not really funny gallows humor joke about the fact his wife was missing. And then it turned out, you know, she was never found again. There's no real other evidence that he was involved, but people based on that alone have painted him with suspicion to me. That's a lot different than what we have here. It's a lot different than say the Chris Watts case, which I say we'll never cover, but we talk about all the time for some reason, you know, you've all seen the documentary. You've seen Chris Watts. You saw the way he was acting. That was evidence of his guilt. Turned out he was very guilty. That's why he was acting that way, because he was nervous that he was going to get caught. And when people look at this, what they see in this is not a grieving mother, not somebody who just had a stranger come into their home, brutally murder their kids, attempt to kill them, and then live with suspicion. She's already under suspicion at this point. She knows the police are looking at her. And a lot of people see this, and they just don't, they can't imagine how this person would act this way in this circumstance. So like we said, don't make up your mind one way or another about this. Don't let this be the thing. But if somebody tells you that this is completely irrelevant and the fact that you feel, you feel something when you see it, like don't be ashamed of that because this is a, this is a piece of evidence. I don't think you can find her guilty on the basis of this alone, but it is a piece of evidence. Brett, do you know that I love it when the sun sets later and the days get longer? I get more time to be outdoors and just live a little bit more. But all the summer activities sometimes means I have even less time to cook and focus on eating foods I know are good for me. That's why I switched up my game with Daily Harvest. It's honestly the best self-care routine I've ever had because Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, flatbreads, smoothies, and more, all built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. And Alice, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I love the broccoli cheese harvest bowl, but I got to tell you, my personal summer favorite is Daily Harvest Scoops. I love ice cream, but these are ice cream with a twist. They're plant-based, Scoops is the perfect sweet treat. It's gluten and dairy-free. And Daily Harvest takes literally minutes to prepare, never uses preservatives, added sugar, or artificial anything. And that goes for every single thing they make. Daily Harvest is delicious food, all built on whole, organic fruits and vegetables that conveniently stays fresh in your freezer so it's ready when you are. It's really the whole package. Get more time back to do you and take care of yourself this summer. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter code OWLS to get $25 off your first box. That's code OWLS for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. That's dailyharvest.com. So that's a silly string incident. We do want to talk about this invasion of privacy thing because several people who wanted us to cover this case actually referenced this and were under the impression that this was a secret recording by the police. It was not. In fact, the police had planted microphones at the gravesite, and they had done that for a reason because people occasionally go to graves and apologize for what they did. You know, they're like unburdening their soul to the person they killed, and they were hoping to catch that on tape to catch Darley going to the graveside and doing that. She did not do that. 
and nothing actually came from those microphones and none of it, none of, none, none of the recordings from the microphone were used during trial. In fact, the only people who used that fact were the defense attorneys and the defense attorneys used it to attack the credibility of the police. It's often stated that the officers pleaded the fifth amendment when they were asked about this, what actually was going on was the defense counsel, he's cross-examining Detective Patterson, who's one of the detectives on this case, and Patterson did not appreciate the fact that the defense counsel kept accusing him of violating the Federal Wiretapping Act. And essentially, the Federal Wiretapping Act says that unless you have a warrant, you can't record someone else if they have an expectation of privacy. So if you're doing that, you're violating the Federal Wiretap Act. It's a little bit more confusing than that, but that's essentially the bare bones of it. At some point, the prosecution objects and they're like, look, if he's going to keep accusing him of a crime, he needs a lawyer and he'll be able to, to assert the fifth amendment and say, I'm not going to testify about this. If you're saying I committed a crime. And at this point, the judge kind of stops the circus and says, look, we don't need to ask any more questions about whether or not they violated federal law. If you want to talk about the fact they recorded, you can. And that is one of the things that the defense attorney is allowed to do is ask him questions about the fact that he set up this recording equipment, that he's recording at the kid's graveside, that nothing came of this, and that sort of thing. Now, you may be wondering, we'll just wrap it all up, did the police violate the law or not? Well, it turns out they did not. Um, There was an investigation into this, but after this case happened, the Fifth Circuit, which is Texas is a part of the Fifth Circuit, actually decided this case and decided that you have no reasonable expectation of privacy in a public graveyard like this. And since you don't have an expectation of privacy, the police could record you just like this, and it would not be a crime. It wouldn't violate the Wiretap Act. Anything you recorded would be admissible in trial. So it turned out a lot of that was kind of fire and smoke about nothing, but it is something people people wonder about because it's kind of a sexy aspect of this with the whole Fifth Amendment angle. Yeah, and this is a great example of um, things getting twisted out of context when people don't quite understand the entire context of the law here. And so the Fifth Amendment was never invoked by uh, the officer. Remember, it's a very serious offense when someone's being accused of a federal crime on under oath, right? And that's why discussion of the Fifth Amendment was brought up. I do think it's really interesting here, just in general. So any of you out there, if you're in the Fifth Circuit, Texas is part of that. Um, you know, maybe don't confess your crimes at a public cemetery because it's uh, a, a public domain for purposes of recording. Now that you know, the more you know, Brett. A little free advice there on how to get away with murder. <laughs> a little like free that. advice. That's not uh, advice. <laughs> that's just yeah, that's from friend to friend. Advice. Don't sue us. Um, <laughs> And another thing, just one tiny little thing, and we'll wrap this up. Some people have pointed to the fact that much of that day, the Silly String Day, was recorded, including when Darlie and her family were sad and doing all the things you would expect them to do, like crying and being sad. And then some people have wondered, why wasn't that played? Why was only the Silly String part played? Well, it never really comes down to the defense. It was the defense's decision whether or not to play the other video and they decided not to do that. I think if you ask them why they would say we wanted to minimize that day as much as possible. People act like it would change it. If you saw Darley crying and sobbing, if we added that context, there was one juror who said something along those lines that he wished he'd seen that. But I just wonder if when the defense looked at it, they didn't think this is going to make her look even worse because it's going to make it look like this is fake. And then, you know, she's all sobbing and wailing and crying. And here she is smacking chewing gum, smiling and spraying silly string all over the place. I don't know that it actually would have helped as much as people seem to believe that it would have. Typically, we we introduce video or phone calls. You only want a snippet of it, but it's always an option for the other side to request that you play the entire recording so that people get the full context. But oftentimes, the jury actually gets angry when they have to watch the same of nothing, and it doesn't actually enlighten them. So that's something that factors into the defense's decision, because instead of making this a two-minute incident, they could drag it out to a two hour long incident where every part of Darley and every little, you know, flinch of the eye is scrutinized by the jury. And they may think that's even worse. 
The Silly String incident is, you know, one of the most famous examples of Darlie's bizarre behavior, but it's not the only one. There's also a teddy bear incident. So their neighbor, Nelda Watts, testified that the fountain in front of the home had become a sort of shrine to the boys where people from the community would come and put teddy bears on it as like a little memorial for the boys. One day, uh, Nelda heard a strange sound, what she described as almost something like children laughing. She looked out her window, and here's what she described into her testimony at trial question what is the first noise that you heard it sounded sort of like children laughing that kind of thing and what did you see then well as i watched for a few minutes the darren would take a stuffed animal off of one of the wreaths and toss it over to darley and she would jump up and catch it and then she would toss it back to him and he would chuck it toward the vehicle the back end of the vehicle was open and if he threw it in she would jump up and cheer Okay, what else did you see? Well, he took a flag off of one of them and she cheered as he climbed up the water fountain and put it at the top of the fountain and it stayed there for several months or or weeks anyway. Okay, then what did you see them do? Well, they started after they got most of the animals off and I didn't stand there the whole time, but I looked again because I was waiting to go out and get the mail. I didn't want to go out there while they were out there doing that. I looked again and they were taking the wreaths and dragging them around toward the back, I assume for the trash. And so I quickly made a run out to the mailbox to check the mail before I left. Okay, and this was on the 18th of June, 1996? Yes, sir, it was the 18th. The 18th being 12 days after both of her sons were murdered, which is very soon after. We're not talking about years afterwards. You know, those of you who've followed the Maura Murray case know that there's been ongoing fights, you know, almost two decades later to keep a wreath up at the site where Maura was last seen because memorials are important. And even though, you know, nearly two decades have passed, family and friends want to go back to that place and have a wreath there, have a place to remember them. And this memorial for the boys, um, the Routier boys, wasn't even created by Darley or Darren. It was actually started by, you know, community members. And this is the way they're kind of making it into a game and essentially disassembling it less than two weeks after the murders. Yeah. And I mean, you guys can make up your mind what you think about this, whether you think it's significant or not, as I said before, I just really feel like this is one of those things that it it just depends on which way you think the the evidence is going. If you really think Darley was attacked, then I don't know that this is going to change anything, if that's what you think based on the evidence. But to me, you have this case where it already, as we've talked about before, seems like a lot of really weird things had to happen for it to be an intruder. And you have to really discount a lot of pieces of evidence. And you have to assume that there were so many mistakes made by various people who were investigating this crime. And only then can you get to Darley, Darley's innocent. And only then if you think it's just not in her makeup to do something like cut her throat. Or she's not clever enough to think of, of leaving a sock some distance away to try and throw off the scent. Or you don't think she has enough motive to kill her kids. If if you think all that's true, that's fine. But particularly when balanced against those, as we said, behavioral things, the not enough motive, not clever enough, not brave enough maybe to cut her own throat, not in the right state of mind to do those things. Well, this is state of mind stuff too. I mean, this is what is her state of mind when her kids have been murdered? And, and you can say all day different people react differently to to death, that may be true, but if this is just Darley acting differently, then her behavior is almost sui generis. I mean, this is this is very this is this is very stark the way she's acting. This to me is not the difference between someone crying all the time and someone being stoic, you know, or even someone dealing with pain through gallows humor. To me, this is this is much more indicative of where she was in her state of mind. And going back to when we talked about why she would have done this and what her motive would have been and how 
I just think it would have been complex. And I think, I don't think this was like a money crime or even an anger crime. I think if she did this, there was just a lot going on with Darley. And this kind of behavior to me is, is just yet more sort of weirdness. I mean, you know, at one point she's trying to sell her jewelry to her, to her housekeeper, you know, who, who didn't have $10,000. That's a weird thing to do. You know, I mean, so is gathering up the teddy bears and, you know, playing basketball with them with your husband and celebrating every time one goes in the truck. I mean, that's a weird thing to do when your kids are barely even buried. But here's the weird thing, Brett. For, you know, up and up until now, we've had um, a lot of weird behavior from Darley. But this is the first time we kind of see Darren in the picture. It's one thing for him to kind of stand by and let her act strangely because of whatever she's going through. But the participation of this kind of game of like football or flag football or something is strange. It is the first time Darren has really raised um, eyebrows for me. Yeah. And if you watch the silly string video, everybody always says, and Darren has said later, well, if I'd had the silly string, it would have been me doing that. Not her. If you watch the video, you can tell Darren's not into it. He is, he is not, I mean, he is playing His along. His eyes are downcast and he's trying, he's trying to be there. Right. And, and like fit in to the situation. But you can tell you all have probably been in those situations before where you've just gotten very bad news and you have to go to some celebration and just pretend um, and, you know, suck it up. That's kind of what it looks like. His eyes are downcast and he does not look like he's, you know, wanting to dance around with silly string whatsoever. And I think you're right. This is the first weird thing from him. And I don't know what to think of him. Um. If he is involved in this, and maybe he is, there's no evidence that he is. I mean, there's just the same amount of evidence that he's involved in it as an intruder is, right? Um, so I don't really know what's going on with him. If Darley is guilty, then he lies several times in his testimony. And there are several things that it seems like he's lying about, whether she's guilty or not. Things like the towel. I mean, little things that, that I think he's saying to kind of help her because he believes her. You know, he, he has always said he does not think she was involved in this. So you have to wonder if maybe occasionally he changed his story a little bit to try and help her out and make her seem like she's less guilty. I don't really know how to explain this behavior. I'd like to plant a little seed. So, you know, they've just lost two of their sons. They do have one more baby who's still there. And she is the mother of her own, his only remaining child who's alive. And I think, you know, he's there right next to her. He sees her every day. He's already lost, I mean, unimaginable things for a parent to lose. Um, and I wonder if he recognizes the oddities in her behavior and he's trying to keep her able to still be a mother to the one child that they have left alive. And I wonder if he sees um, a really dangerous place that she is mentally, but she is the only mother for, you know, their child. And I, I just wonder if perhaps there is some sort of desperation in keeping her on the light side. You know, those of those of you who may have um, dealt with people who are struggling with um, mental illness uh, or depression know that the coin can flip really quickly. You try very hard to keep people when where they are laughing and where they are happy because you know that one inexplicable thing can cause them to fall into darkness and obviously whether she did it or not there is a lot of darkness of what just happened we're within two weeks of her two sons being brutally murdered um so i don't i don't know what's going on with darren except that this is the first time that anything is making me question what he's doing and i wonder if you know typically these things don't come out of the blue so i'm giving him the benefit of the doubt here and there was, there was talk amongst her friends, which has been reported. I don't believe it ever made its way into the trial record and probably was not relevant enough to do so. That Darley had told people they were going to go on a trip and try and have the girl, the baby girl that they had always wanted. So maybe it's also part of that. He's sort of like trying to, to get her to think about the future, not what happened. That's an interesting question. Figuring out what he's thinking is even more difficult than figuring out what Darley's thinking. It's it's certainly one of those things that strikes you as strange. And, and I would be interested to hear from people who do believe that he may have had some involvement 
in this crime, why you think that, and if there's any any evidence really pointing you in that direction. And I should know, I, I, you know, my my thought right there and giving him the benefit of the doubt is because of what you just said, Brett, that there's as much evidence of him being involved with his son's murders as there is an intruder. And so if there were more evidence stacked against him, I think I'd be less willing to give him the benefit of the doubt and thinking of other explanations for his strange, strange action here with the teddy bears. Because it is strange, certainly strange, for him to be participating in this game, unlike with the silly string where he didn't participate, even though he stated that he would have participated. Alice, before we continue, I want to talk about one of our favorite sponsors, the blue light glasses that started it all, Felix Gray. Five years ago, Felix Gray realized our eyes aren't meant to look at screens all day. And Alice, I think you agree with me, they certainly aren't. And so Felix Gray designed glasses to make daily screen time more comfortable and the workday more productive. Now, more than ever, Americans are spending more time on computers, phones, tablets, gaming devices, and so many other sources of blue light. Felix Gray glasses are not like other blue light lenses. Brett, you're so right. Um, you know, all day I work in front of a computer and I get headaches and my eyes get dry from looking at screens all day. But now with Felix Gray lenses that filter 15 times more blue light that can make screen time tough on eyes and disruptive to sleep, I can feel the difference. Um, I can tell that my eyes aren't as dry. I don't get headaches after looking at a screen all day. And the best part is they come in non-prescription and prescription lenses. You can check them out now at felixgrayglasses.com slash tp. I got the Roebling Sazerac crystal and I love the way it makes me look. It's chic and they do a great job filtering out blue light. And I got the Hamilton glasses and those of you who took part in our last Get Vocal actually got to see me wearing them. So we love Felix Gray and we believe in this product. So get yourself a pair of glasses made for the 21st century and designed for modern, hardworking eyes. You have nothing to lose, except maybe eye strain. Go to felixgrayglasses.com slash TP for the best blue light glasses on the market. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash TP. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges. felixgrayglasses.com slash TP. P. So we're going to sum up everything in this case the way that the prosecution did. In their case, the very last witness they called was Alan Brantley, who was a special agent and psychologist assigned to the FBI National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. So behavior, right? We're going, we're going right into the FBI behavioral analysis. And he reviewed the investigative reports, the crime scene photographs, witness statements, all the evidence. And he provided this analysis at the conclusion of the case. And in his opinion, the boys were killed by someone they knew well, and the crime scene was staged. The state's appellate brief uh, for one of Darley's appeals lays out the factors that he testified to in a fairly lengthy testimony that supported this opinion. And he's testifying as as an expert on violent crime. So I have a feeling that his opinion probably did go pretty far with the jury, but we're going to walk through just some of these factors that he pointed to. One factor he pointed to was the absence of similar crimes in the area. I'll note some people will debate this because they'll point to a a serial rapist who was active in Dallas. That person, while active in Dallas, was never active in Rowlett, Texas. I mean, it's close, but it's not the same city. And certainly this kind of brutal murder was not a part of their MO and not something that anyone had seen in this area, which, as he pointed out, was generally a low crime area. The crime scene was high risk for a criminal. There were other houses nearby, lights were on, a car was visible in front of the house, and the house was on a cul-de-sac. If you believe this was a burglar who did this, or, I mean, really, if you believe it was any kind of criminal, but I feel like burglars are professionals, in a way, and typically they're looking for the easy target. They're looking for the target that they they can rob easily. The house next door to me 
was was broken into over Christmas. Mine was not. The reason is because the people next door to me had moved out. There was a for sale sign in the front yard, and whoever broke in knew there was nobody there. You know, there was no dog barking in the front yard, right? They didn't break into my house, and hopefully they never will. But there were reasons for them not to do that. That was an easier target, and criminals tend to go for the easier target. Another thing, the alleged point of entry, the window, was actually intimidating because of the animal cage immediately inside the garage. We didn't talk about this, but there was a large dog cage inside the garage. It was interesting because I don't think their dog was that big, but they had this, this cage, and you could imagine if you're a burglar, and for whatever reason, you've picked this house, you, despite the lights, despite the car, despite the fact it's in a cul-de-sac, you're going you know, to rob this house. You go in, and you immediately see this large dog cage. That might make you think twice. I remember we we stated on a previous episode that um, you know, there was a survey done of people currently serving time in uh, prison and jails for burglaries. And when asked what was the one, you know, what is one factor that would make you decide not to rob a house? And they said the presence of a dog any size because of the unpredictability, the ability to bite, the ability to alert with their barks. Um, they just didn't know what kind of dog they would encounter. So if they typically saw a dog or presence uh, indicating presence of a dog, like a dog cage, they would move on. Not lights, not bolts on the doors, not cars in the driveways. I mean, it was dogs. And so this is actually a very interesting note that the window itself, you could see this animal cage. And People serving time now will tell you that they don't even care how large the dog is. But I, I would say, you know, if you saw such a large cage, you would at least think, you know, this is not just some little lap dog who could do some damage to me. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, they're going to be barking. It's going to make your, your, you know, attack on the house more difficult. It's just, it's just most criminals don't act this way. I mean, if you think this is, you know, a crazed serial killer, maybe that overcomes this. But even a serial killer... You get to be a serial killer because you succeed the first time, right? And typically, you're you're looking for easy targets. Another thing which almost strikes you as an amateurish mistake is that the FBI typically sees window screens removed during crimes rather than cut. It was actually unusual to just have the screen cut, which you can you can imagine why that would be. It probably makes noise. To cut a screen, you then have to go through the cut screen. You might leave evidence behind. Clothes might be torn, DNA, blood. I mean, any number of things on that screen as you're passing through, and it's sort of passing over you. And, in fact, most burglars just take the screen out. They don't, they don't bother cutting it, so that seems like an unusual thing. The route through the garage was risky in the dark. Remember, this: if this person came in, they're breaking into a house they don't know. They're going through a garage they don't know to commit a fairly, well, if they planned on doing this, an incredibly violent crime, but even if they're just trying to rob the place, they've seen the car, they've got to think that it's at least possible somebody's in that house, and yet they're going through the garage in the dark where they could easily trip over something. This is something people point to in the Ramsey case, and John Bonet Ramsey is a reason to think it was an inside job, is you have to believe that the person who broke in managed to navigate the house, having never been in there before, and... Sort of like this. This person is navigating the house in the dark. They make no noise. They don't run into anything. And they don't leave any evidence of their presence, either coming in or going out. The focus on the children, which we've talked about, was unusual and risky, given the presence of an adult right there. It's not even that Darley's in another room. And maybe you want to eliminate the children so they don't interrupt you when you go find Darley. To do whatever it is you want to do. But you have... You have someone who is attacking the children first, even though there's an adult there, who if they wake up, I mean, remember, it's not just that Darley's story is that she didn't wake up. Your killer would have to be acting this way, knowing that she probably would wake up, and yet they attack the children first, not her. And then there's the wounds, which we've talked about, which are dramatically different in type and severity from her wounds, even if you think her wounds are not superficial, even if you want to call them life-threatening, they're certainly different than plunging a knife all the way through the body of a person into their chest. This is a different type of wound and a different viciousness to that than what Darley suffered. And her statement that she chased the intruder out 
was entirely inconsistent with what you would expect from a violent crime when you have the disparity in her size and the described size of this intruder. Apparently, Darley's saying that she, this guy who was armed with a knife, who has a jump on her, who's already cut her, just decides to leave and, and doesn't, you know, doesn't do anything to stop this person from following him. That just doesn't jive with what people tend to see and what the FBI tends to see in cases like this. Absolutely. As you can see, this uh, behavioral analysis is very detailed and it continues. He then testified that dropping a weapon while fleeing is risky and inconsistent with most reported crimes. And that's because, as you can imagine, if you're fleeing and you drop your weapon, that's evidence left behind. But also the person who is chasing you or who is still alive behind you can pick up that weapon and come after you. Um, that's why typically the murder weapon goes with the um, perpetrator. Uh, but that's not what happened here. And also, if you remember that sock that was dropped a few few doors down, the location of the sock was inconsistent with a real crime because it was the opposite direction of the exit from the cul-de-sac. Usually, you are looking for your fastest way out. You're not doing, you know, circles in the cul-de-sac, um, warming up before you zoom out of the cul-de-sac. I don't know if we made that clear when we talked about this. People always talk about the distance from the house where the sock was found, but they don't generally talk about the direction. And it would be one thing if you saw the sock going out of the cul-de-sac, because that's how you would imagine this person would leave. They would leave out of the cul-de-sac to go to their car. Maybe that black car that we've heard so much about, and maybe they dropped the sock there. You have to believe this person has killed two people, brutally stabbed another, knows that last person is still alive, has fled the scene while dropping their knife, and then, rather than head out, out of the cul-de-sac, away from the cul-de-sac, wanders around sort of in an alley in the back and drops off this sock, and then leaves. And that's a very strange thing to think this person would do in that circumstance. And likely this person left the way they came from. And so this is not the first time they've seen the cul-de-sac. They saw the cul-de-sac coming into the cul-de-sac. And so it is unlikely that they were just caught unawares and ran the wrong direction. Now, we've already discussed this a little bit, but the strange thing about this crime is that the children are the low-risk victims in this case because of their ages, their young ages, and, you know, their place in society, who they are. They probably, they're not old enough to be wheeling and dealing in some sort of black market or some sort of illicit activity where they are secretly have another life. They're just, they're kind of too young to be part of the object of anyone's ire. Yet it appears that these children were the object of the attack. They were the ones that really got the brunt of the attack. And that suggests that there's a personal motive for the attack. Maybe this is a stranger, but the, not the way these the attack was carried out on the kids. Now, the attack appeared to be a personal assault because there were no indications of theft or robbery. And we mentioned that Again, there were things of value and of sentimental value in the house that were left, and no one took those. So it seems that the person broke in only to inflict these harms on the children and maybe Darley, but not in order to come in and steal things. And these people were some sort of a surprise standing in the way of a theft or robbery. Now, the maximum damage to the children, but minimum damage to the property inside the home suggested a proprietary interest in the contents of the home. And that just means that you care about what's in the home. You know, typically you don't go into your own home and smash up all the windows and the plates, for example, because you care about what's in your home. You know, this actually, this is not funny, but this reminds me of an episode of Friends. Brett, I don't know if you were a watcher of Friends, but there's an episode where Chandler, so Chandler works at an office building and uh, one of his friends uh, goes with him to work one day and this guy walks by, Bob, and Bob says to Chandler, hey, Toby. And Toby is not Chandler's name. And uh, Chandler says, well, he's been calling me Toby for so many years. I just don't want to tell him that my name's really Chandler. And so go on down the line. He basically blocks this guy from getting a promotion. And Bob gets really mad at a man named Chandler. But he doesn't realize that Chandler is actually Toby. And so Bob starts smashing everything in Chandler's office. And Chandler walks in. And he says, man, what are you doing? And he goes, come help me. This is Chandler's office. And to pretend to not be 
Chandler. Chandler actually <laughs> smashes everything in his office, right? And it's like a hilarious scene, but the point is no one would do that to their own own office, their own property, because you care, you have sentimental value, you care about the things that you do. And so what the FBI is saying here, the fact that there's so little damage to the property makes them think that someone cared about the things. You you think about the way you treat your own home. You don't you care about bumping into the walls because you don't want to leave dents into the wall. You care about if you drop a plate on the floor because maybe it dented your hardwood floors. You think about those things, something that an outsider would not care about. So they're looking at not just whether things were stolen, but every little detail of how little how little damage was done to the home that you would think an intruder would not care about. And this kind of goes back to the murders are messy thing. It's kind of a corollary to that. If somebody's coming in and, you know, invading your home and murdering people, they're not going to be super careful. It's kind of like we were talking about with the dust. Yeah, you can enter through that window and not disturb anything. But why would you care to do that if you're there to rob and murder? You know, why would you not leave bloody footprints all over the place? Why would you not knock things over? Why would you not destroy things? Why would the only thing that you really do is kill some people? And then leave. I mean, it's it's a very strange thing for an outsider to do. Absolutely. Th- think about the the quintessential um, I don't know movie of someone breaking into a house. They do things that are completely unnecessary that mess up the place. Right? They knock over lamps. They don't care about the lamp. They don't care if it breaks. They didn't really have to knock over the lamp in order to break into the house, but they do it because they couldn't care less about what's in the house. Nothing of that sort happened here. Now, the minimal damage in the living room or the Roman room, was inconsistent with a struggle between two adults. Remember what Darlie said. She woke up in the living room and someone was standing over her or walking away, something along those lines, and she struggled with that person. But that nothing in that room indicates there was any sort of struggle between two adults. Yeah, I mean, she's got... And we've we've talked about this so many times. If you believe she has all these defensive wounds on her, these horrible bruising, these cuts... If you believe all those are defensive wounds, there had to have been a defense. There had to have been a fight. There had to be a struggle. Even if she doesn't remember it, it had to have happened. And yet, once again, there's no evidence of it. Right. And there's more things about the crime scene that suggest it was staged. For example, the position of the vacuum cleaner on top of bloodstain suggests that it was deliberately placed there. There was absence of blood in the garage where Darley said was the escape route for the intruder. There was the presence, we've already just talked about, of window screen debris on a knife from inside the house. It makes no sense to cut how you could cut a screen from the outside to enter the home with a knife that's inside the home before you cut the screen. The use of two knives from the same knife block inside the house in committing the offense was inconsistent because most offenders will carry weapons with them to the crime scenes. So not only does it make no sense that a knife inside the house is cutting the screen from the outside in order to gain entry, that they would then change out the knives to use a different knife from the same knife block in order to stab um, their victims. And also, like what we were talking about with the proprietary interest, the knife was actually, one of the knives was actually placed back into the knife block. This suggests that you care about the knife. Why not just toss it to the side? Someone who is just breaking in to commit murders or to steal things, they don't care if the knife is back in the knife block. So the fact that it's placed back in highly points to someone in the house, an inside job, that someone who cares about the knife, someone who cares about what's inside the home, put that knife back into that knife block. And I said this a couple uh a couple episodes earlier, and I'm sure we'll get some controversy about it, that if the that bread knife was used to cut that screen, if that's true, if you can't figure out a way to show that that's cross-contamination or a mistake by technicians, if you can't do that, to me, that's enough to believe that Darley did this. And, and for all these reasons, you know, it shows that that was the knife used to cut it. The knife is back in the knife block. It's weird that you would use a knife from the knife block to cut the screen, which you would need to cut to get in there in the first place, all that stuff. I mean, that piece of evidence, if it's accurate, if you can't undermine it, is so powerful. It's unexplainable to me uh, for an outsider to have been able to do that. You know, the behavioral analyst 
stated that jewelry was in plain view in the house, but it was left undisturbed. Again, if someone came in and wanted to rob them, they left jewelry that she was trying to sell to her housekeeper right there on the table. And it certainly had some value. She was trying to get $10,000 for it without taking it. Even if that wasn't the object of uh, the intruder, you would think if an intruder came in and just wanted to murder some kids, saw expensive jewelry, they would just go ahead and pocket it. Why not? Now, the killing of the children was inconsistent with a sexual assault attack because children are usually used as leverage to control the object of the sexual assault. And in this case, the kids were murdered before any sort of sexual assault took place with respect to Darley. So they weren't any leverage if they were already murdered. And I just want to point out, those of you who want to point to that serial rapist who was active in Dallas at this time, he would actually do that. He would use children to gain control after the woman of the house. He, would, he wouldn't he would murder them. He would keep them alive and basically say, you either do what I tell you or I'm going to hurt your kid. That was the way he operated. So you have to believe, if you think it was that person, that his MO radically changed this night. And it's also, I think, ineffective. Oh, you know, yeah. Then, then you're just working on fear. And if I were Darley, I would say my husband's upstairs. You know, I'm, I'm not alone. This is not it. But you've just heard kind of the testimony of the FBI behavioral analyst, and it's looking pretty damning against Darley. I found, I found this testimony to be very powerful, and I had not heard about this, or I did not hear about this. When I listened to some other coverage on this case, I never really heard about this guy's testimony, and really just a perfect closing witness because not only does he walk you through why it appears to be a staged crime scene, but he's able to walk you through all the evidence, right? I mean, this is like... This is a closing argument before closing. Perfect. It's a closing argument given by a witness who also happens to be an expert. I mean, this is, this is powerful stuff. And the defense... This is as good as it gets in your witnesses. It really is. And if you're interested in witnesses being qualified and challenges to expert witnesses... It's actually worth reading this guy's testimony. If you go and you find his testimony on one of those websites we've linked to, at the very beginning of it, it's what's called the Daubert analysis, where the judge and the two lawyers actually debate whether or not this guy should be able to testify as an expert. It's pretty cool, pretty interesting stuff. I mean, it's interesting to me. It may not be interesting to you because... This is pretty powerful. You have a guy come in and say, I'm an expert on behavior. I'm an expert on violent crime. And guess what? This is a stage scene for all these reasons. That's a pretty powerful witness. So this is another case where one of two things happened. And this is like going back to old Jeffrey McDonald, right? One of two things happened. We had the testimony of a victim. And the victim says, there was an intruder. So let's walk through that. Either Darley killed the kids or this intruder did. There's no in-between. So what would have had to have happened for an intruder to have committed this crime? And we'll walk you through what this intruder would have had to have done. There's a map that we're going to post on the website of the home, which I think helps you sort of visualize this. So this is what would have went down. For reasons that are unclear, someone entered the Routier house at night by cutting the screen in the back window. They did so with a knife that they would not use again and without disturbing anything in the process. They slipped through the screen, and walked through the garage into a utility room, which they did, despite the fact it was dark, and they did not know the area without alerting anyone to their presence. They enter the kitchen, go to the knife block, and remove a knife. They then bypass the jewelry, which earlier we know Darley had asked for $10,000 for, which is sitting on the kitchen table, and continue on into the next room. At this point, the intruder would have seen Darley and the two kids sleeping in the family room. Some have speculated that perhaps the intruder would have stumbled over Damon due to his position between the family room and the kitchen, and this would explain maybe the bloody scene. He didn't intend to do this, but he stumbles upon the kid. Chaos ensues. Murder happens. But we're almost certain this didn't happen, and... One, you would expect a sudden shock to have woken both Devin and Darley. Darley doesn't say that happened. Based on where Devin is found, it doesn't seem like he moved. Two, and probably more important than that, we know from the blood trail that Damon moved from the living room towards the kitchen after he was initially stabbed. And once again, remember, if you believe this story, then you also believe Darley's story. And Darley supports this because she says... 
that when she woke up, Damon actually follows her towards the kitchen before he collapses where he's found. So he doesn't start off there. He ends up there. So probably no stumbling over anybody. And remember, Darley's story is that she was awakened by Damon at the couch. And so that's consistent with the testimony that he was sleeping about a foot away from her on the floor, which once again is her own testimony. At this point, the killer decides to kill everyone in the room. He picks up a sock and slips it over the gloves he's already wearing, thus preventing any evidence of his existence. Transferring to the sock, I guess, would be his theory. He attacks the boys first, stabbing them to death. What happens to the sock at this point is a little unclear, as it does not have Darley's blood on it. Maybe he drops it and picks it up later. We don't know. But in any event, for Darley's story to work, she must have woken up at this point and fought with the man. She has her throat cut during the fight and, and sustains those incredible bruises that you've seen, the ones all up and down her arm. And she also suffers some defensive wounds during this struggle, but she does it in a way that doesn't displace anything in the room, doesn't really knock anything over, doesn't leave any evidence of a struggle. At this point, she collapses back down onto the couch where she had been sleeping before and passes out. But she does so without leaving much blood evidence on the couch, which you would expect if she's bleeding from a stab wound that she has suffered in the struggle while she's laying on the couch. In any event, due to the trauma of the event, she does not recall what we just described. She doesn't remember that struggle at all. At this point, the man, I suppose he recovers the sock that he dropped because he wasn't using it when he stabbed Darley because there's none of Darley's blood on it. Damon crawls over to where Darley is, wakes her up. The man, for reasons that we don't know, decides not to finish off Darley, but instead turns and walks away. If he is a burglar, he steals nothing. If he is a rapist, he does not assault Darley. He must he was either just a cold blooded killer, or once the killing started, he just decided, I don't want any more of this. But either way, he's someone who decided to kill the two boys, but wasn't so efficient and wasn't so concerned about someone identifying him that he would finish off the woman who he knows is awake and who he just fought and who is following him out of the room. Darley, rejuvenated, continues to follow him with Damon trailing behind her. Damon reaches the kitchen or the area in between the kitchen and living room and collapses himself. The murderer walks into the utility room and drops the knife with Darley still behind him. She picks up the knife, and he disappears into the garage. He escapes without leaving any, any bloody footprints or a blood trail or any blood at all in the garage itself. He walks down the alley away from the cul-de-sac, drops the sock in front of both a sewer drain and a trash can, but doesn't throw it down the sewer drain, doesn't throw it down the trash can, turns around, goes out the cul-de-sac, presumably to a vehicle, or he just walks off into the distance. He, he took the sock with him to avoid leaving it behind as evidence, but he did not take the knife, which is the chief piece of evidence, the weapon that he used to murder the boys, and then at this point, Darley calls the police. That's essentially what you have to believe happened if the intruder theory is correct. I feel like I had to do so much flexible mental gymnastics to wrap that story around the set of facts. And that's the thing is you have the set of facts and you're having to weave a story to fit all of the facts. And I think when you have a situation like this where there really are only two options, I think it's worth doing this. And I think it's worth trying to think through what exactly would had to have happened for it to go the way that you're being told it went. And maybe it did go that way. Maybe everything I just said happened, but does the evidence support it? Does it make sense to you? I mean, those are questions really only you can answer for yourself. Like Brett said, there's only one other option. There's really no in-between. The story you just heard, the intruders did it or Darley did it. So what would it look like if Darley did it? Let's talk about where she was mentally. Darley is in a dark place. She's suffering from postpartum depression. She's facing mounting financial pressures. Her husband is becoming verbally and emotionally abusive towards her. She just wants things to go back to the way they were when the boys were younger and they didn't have any money problems. 
All of this culminates the night of the murders after Darley and Darren stay up late talking about their problems. Neither of them have ever been entirely forthcoming about what was discussed or how it was discussed that night. But based on what others have said, it's unlikely it was anything other than angry. It was probably pretty explosive. So Darley acts. She waits until Darren is asleep upstairs. She gets the bread knife out of the block, walks out back around to where the window is located, and cuts the screen. She goes back inside, puts that knife back into the block, and pulls out the larger, sharper butcher knife. She goes back into the living room and stabs the oldest boy, Devin. She then turns to Damon, who she also stabs. She takes the sock, dabs it in each boy's blood, and then goes outside and drops it several doors down. She goes back into her house and goes to the kitchen sink. At this point, she really needs to gather all of her confidence because she braces herself before she cuts her own throat. She washes the blood away from the sink, trying to cover up what she did. There's a problem, though. She turns around and realizes that Damon is actually still alive. In fact, he's moved from the family room to right in front of the kitchen, heading towards the door, and a blood trail from the family room to his body seems to confirm this. There was a mixture of Damon and Darley's blood on her shirt, a mixture that the state's expert described as cast off. It's likely that when she saw Damon moving, she went over to where he lay and stabbed him again, mixing her blood with his, and leaving the stain on the back of her shirt. Incidentally, this also accounts for the timing of Damon's death. If he did live until the paramedics arrived, it's because Darley finished him off last. She calls 911, and the show began. So that is what may have happened. And what that's likely what happens. That's what the evidence shows if Darley did it. And, you know, in either one of those scenarios, whichever one you think happened, there's some variation. We'll never know. The thing about these crimes, you never know exactly what happened. Even when you know exactly who did it, even when they confess, there are often still little unknown things. I keep going back to the Chris Watts case, but there's little unknown things in the Chris Watts case that people can't figure out because his story changes all the time. And, you know, who knows? Who knows how everything actually happened? And I think it's similar here. Whatever you think happened, there were little changes, little differences. But essentially, I think that's you have to believe that essentially one of those things happened. And which one makes sense? Which one fits the evidence? Which one fits your experience? And that's what the jury was faced with. I don't think it's any secret at this point what I think happened. I think Darley is responsible for this. I think she murdered her children. I think uh, what Alice just said is is probably what happened. Alice, I don't know if, if you have a, a thought on that one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, between those two stories, because like we said, it's really not um, a spectrum. It's not somewhere in between. It's one side of the coin or the other. Darley did it or the intruder. And the intruder story is just, just unbelievable to me. And so that leaves it to Darley. But I think it's a little bit more complex than what I just described as what happened. I think... Timeline wise, that's probably what happened because of the blood evidence. I think she did stab the two boys and and then, you know, cut her own throat and then finished off Damon. That's what the evidence shows. But I think it's a little bit more complex. I'm not sure that she was just murdering the boys to go back to a simpler time. I do think that she was probably in a very dark place mentally. It may have been because of this postpartum depression. I think we see signs of this in the days after the boy's death, the silly string incident and the teddy bear incident. I think there are some massive swings and you know, postpartum depression, there's a lot more talk about it now, but some estimates have it of being more than, you know, 50% of women have some sort of postpartum depression up to a year or longer after they've had a baby. Her baby here is under a year old. And for those with severe postpartum depression, and I do think she was suffering from probably a severe, severe version of it, the statistics are not clear because it often goes underreported. And unless something, you know, tragic, like 
murdering your own children happens, we don't always know about severe postpartum depression. But the numbers I've seen span from 10 to 20% of women experience severe postpartum depression. And some of those signs are wanting to kill yourself, to kill your children, because you not because you want to end their lives or your own life, but because there's kind of this darkness that you have you have no way out of. So I don't think she was just trying to murder her children. I think she was trying to do a murder suicide. I think it's very difficult to cut your own throat unless you are trying to end your life. I think once she finished off her sons, she wanted to kill herself. And when she was unsuccessful in killing herself, you know, two millimeters away from killing herself, we've said that basically it's impossible to cut your throat without coming that close of killing yourself. And I think most people, when they think of cutting their own throat, they think that is a death sentence. Unlike if you stab somewhere else on yourself, think of Jeffrey McDonald. If you stab yourself in the chest, it is very possible you can survive that. I think most lay people, she doesn't have medical training, think of cutting your own throat as killing yourself. I think at some point after she cut her throat, she realized that she was not successful in cutting herself, but she could not be the one who just murdered her children. She she was supposed to die as well. And so that's when I think she began to clean up the, the crime scene. Um, and I think that accounts for her bizarre, bizarre kind of bone chilling um, reactions, both at the grave site with the silly string and also with the game of football with the teddy bears that were set up as a memorial for her children just within two weeks of them being murdered. Um, and I think... I don't think Darren had anything to do with the murders, but I think Darren knew what his wife was suffering from. And I think he knew that something happened that night that may have set her off, that may have pushed her over the ledge. And he may feel some responsibility, even if he doesn't know exactly what happened. And he is, he knows some degree of the truth. I don't know if he knows all of the truth. And I don't know whether he's trying to cover for her or just trying to hold the pieces together of a very, very broken reality for him. So at the end of the day, I think Darlie did this, but I think it's a little bit more complicated than just her wanting to murder her kids. I think that's really interesting. One thing that I've read many places, which I assume is true, but someone correct me if I'm not, if it's not, is that after the crime, Darlie's will... And the life insurance policies for the kids were found on the table or in the table next to the couch where she was asleep. And this is actually a really interesting point you make, Alice, about the suicide theory, because it actually would answer a lot of questions. Really interesting what you were saying about cutting your throat, that you would just assume that's going to do it. You know, you're not you're not aiming for two millimeters away. You're not. You're just cutting your throat. And why would she do that? Because she doesn't want to be seen as a murderer of her kids. Even if she is murdering her kids, she wants to be dead and she wants her kids to be dead and she wants to be remembered well, right? I mean, isn't that essentially what you think would be going through her head if Absolutely. she did that? I, I mean, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what happened. I don't know if she lost it and killed her kids and she couldn't live with herself and she wanted to kill herself or, as well, or she wanted to kill herself in the first instance and didn't want her children to grow up without a mother or that you have to remember if she's in this dark place, life is terrible for everyone, not just her. And she's may be thinking that she's doing them a favor. So I'm not sure which happened first, that she wanted to kill herself first and save her children the, you know, the pain of this dark world she wanted to leave behind, or that in this fit of depression, um, this episode, she killed her kids and couldn't face it. And she wanted to die as well. I'm not sure which order it was in. And I'm really glad you talked about the postpartum depression, because I feel like a lot of people when they talk about this really poo poo that as as part of what happened. They're like, oh, what? She was depressed. So she killed her kids. And it's just it's a lot worse than that. It's not you're just sad. I mean, as you know, Alice, and as as I've recently experienced, the last thing you do before you leave the hospital with a new baby as they go through this stuff. If you are, they talk to your wife and they say, if you're experiencing any of these feelings, thoughts of harming yourself, thoughts of harming your children, you know, immediately call for help, that kind of thing. I mean, it's something that is a real thing that we don't talk about a lot as a society, but it's pretty clear she was suffering from it to at least some extent. And if she did this, I do think it played a pretty significant role. One thing I find interesting about this case this is a death penalty case. Darlie's on death row. If Darlie had admitted to this, I wonder if everything we just talked about, assuming it's true, would have been a powerful enough mitigating factor to have kept her from getting 
the death penalty, when death penalties are decided, there's what they call aggravating factors and mitigating factors. Obvious aggravating factors here is you had two kids who were murdered. That's going to make you death penalty eligible. But then you may have mitigating factors that would weigh on the other side and lead someone to spare you. You guys all know how I feel about people who hurt kids. You know, the fact that Chris Watts is going to spend the rest of his life writing love letters to his admirers and whining about the fact he misses his family kind of drives me crazy. But I do think this is one of those cases where, given everything I think was going on, I, think, I do think if Darlene had accepted responsibility and admitted what she did and talked about these issues, I think it would be interesting whether or not she would have ended up on death row or not. I'll go into that, but let me go backwards real quick. Sorry, I just looked up something. You know, two more things to to know about the potential for severe postpartum depression is that she had been sleeping elsewhere, and she said that she was sleeping downstairs because the baby was sleeping in her room. And as some of you may know, a, a torture tactic, uh, like for for the military, is sleep deprivation, and obviously. Um, that's one of the the hallmarks of having a new baby, right? Even just, even not a newborn, but a baby under a year old is the lack of regular sleep. And the lack of regular sleep and sleep deprivation over a period of time matched with dramatic changes in hormones can lead to kind of the severe form of postpartum depression. And so again, it's very difficult for people who may not be experiencing these waves of hormones. You know, i in fact, just was talking to a friend who had a baby this past week, and she is typically a very even keeled kind of person. And she said, I have never experienced waves of hormones like this before. My my body physically shakes throughout the day because of changes in hormones. Imagine that for your for your mind, for your brain. It's It's something that I think is very difficult if you have not gone through it to understand how it could lead you to do something as, as you know, devastating as trying to kill yourself and your children. Not that it excuses it, but that it could potentially explain what is happening here. Now, if we had some medical experts to explain the severity of postpartum depression on Darley's behalf, would that be enough mitigating evidence to get her off death row? Maybe. I'm not I'm not sure about it, but I certainly think that there would be a camp of people who would be it would spark a conversation that would need to happen in this nation and probably needed to happen for Darlie as well. She didn't, if Darren knew about this, she didn't need Darren to be playing football with her son's teddy bear memorials in order to make her feel better. She would have needed him to tell a medical professional well before it reached this point. So there may be many of you who disagree with us. Plenty of people do. There are lots of different podcasts on this issue. Frankly, I think they all disagree with us. So <laughs> there's like there's a memo that went around <laughs> to the uh, podcasting community that Darlie is innocent. And we missed the memo. So if you want to get the other side of this, um, Women in Crime did this case. True Crime Garage did this case. Riddle Me That is doing this case right now and is talking to a bunch of experts and is really interesting. Lots of people have done this case. Most of them come down on Darlie being innocent. So I would recommend you go listen to those podcasts, see what they have to say, and, and just see how it comes out for you. See if there's anything in there that we've left out. If there is, we'd love to to hear it. I was talking to Maggie Freeling about this case today. She thinks Darlie's innocent. Everybody thinks Darlie's innocent, except for us. So maybe she is. You know, the Innocence Project has her case. She's got a lawyer. They're testing DNA. Who knows? Maybe DNA will come back from a serial killer, and we'll have to apologize to Darlie. Possible. But as I see the evidence today, I think she's guilty, and I think she's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. We'll see if new evidence comes along to change that. I do want to leave you with a counterfactual, though, because I think this is always interesting. You know, we talked about this a little bit with Jeffrey McDonald, and I'll tell you, the reason we picked this case to pair with Jeffrey McDonald, people people often praise us for not being biased, for approaching things in an unbiased way, and and I think we generally do, just because we don't have a dog in the in the hunt, as it were, but once you finish all your, you know, all your research, you're going to be biased because you know all the evidence at that point, so it's kind of hard sometimes not to give it away what we think until it's over and try and present you both sides equally. 
The reason we picked this case is because I actually thought we would come to the conclusion that Darlie was innocent just because everybody else seemed to think she was innocent. So I thought that that's interesting. Sort of our bias was overcome in that way. But to this, to this counterfactual, I want to leave you with. Imagine this scenario. Imagine with everything we know, all the evidence that was collected against Darlie, or all the evidence that's there, just all the evidence that's there. Imagine that after Darlie tells his story, the police had gone out, they'd rounded up the usual suspects. Maybe they found one of those robbers who was involved in trying to break into the house down the street. They arrest that guy. He's taken into custody. They bring Darlie in. She identifies him. That's the guy. That's the guy who stabbed my kids. That's the guy who stabbed me. They go to trial. Now, you know the, you know the evidence, right? There's, there's no actual evidence of an intruder. So this person, if they were convicted, would be convicted on the basis of being in the area at the time and Darley's identification. To me, that is the perfect setup for a false conviction. Not Darley, but that, where that scenario happened. And imagine if that scenario had happened. If it had happened, what I think you would see is everybody would be clamoring for the state to reconsider that conviction and look at the mom. I think that's what you would see. You would see the opposite of what you see now. So, you know, I get it. It's an emotional case. A lot of people feel very strongly about this case. But when I look at the evidence, it's just hard for me to see anything other than Darley being responsible. But we want to hear from you. Shoot us an email. Let us know what you think. Let us know all the reasons we're wrong. I think this is probably going to be our most controversial conclusion. The other one was probably Michael Peterson. I think most people think Scott Peterson's guilty. Most people think Jeffrey McDonald's guilty. Um, I don't know anybody who thinks Timogen Kinsu is guilty. He's obviously innocent. Uh, but this may be our most controversial. So we want to hear from you. We want to hear your thoughts. Prosecutorspod at gmail.com, at prosecutorspod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Join us on Patreon if you want to discuss this or if you want to discuss it in a future Get Vocal. I am sure the folks on the gallery on Facebook are discussing this and have talked a lot about this case. So join their conversation. I think it is a good one that you will enjoy. Do leave those five-star reviews on Apple. We love getting them. We love reading them. And stop by our shop, pick up a shirt or a onesie or a coffee mug, whatever makes you happy. Well, Alice, before we sign off, is there anything else you want to add? No, but we really got to move away from these really sad children cases. We have a very interesting case coming to you next week. It's a case that does not involve the murder of children, and it is a case that is unsolved and needs to be solved, and you guys can help solve it. So we're going to do what Alice said. We're going to move away from this to a, a equally tragic case in many ways, but one that really needs more attention and the victim needs more attention because before she was murdered, she was an amazing person. So we will talk about that case next week. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. End of the end of the podcast. <laughs> oh, whatever. You were a rock star. Also, there is Joe Munoz. 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 <laughs> Joe. Joe Munoz. Joe Munoz. Joe Munoz. What do you think? I think it's Munoz. <laughs> Munoz. Munoz. Yeah, it's Munoz. Spanish. Okay. I know. I'm not. I'm not very good with the you know, accent. You're fine. You're fine. Okay.
I ramble too much there? <laughs> you're fine. I, I think you're only like a paragraph in, though, right? Uh, but we okay. have plenty of time. Plenty okay. Time, Alice. You trying to you trying to hold me back? No, you just stopped like it was my turn. No, no, no. I just didn't know if you had anything else oh. to say because I've been rambling <laughs> no, for like you're ten. Good. Hours.